Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to worship here this morning on this uh, first Sunday of September. Our last Sunday worshiping together here at 9 o'clock, a reminder that next week we'll move uh, back to two worship times on Sunday, September the 12th. So that'll be at 8 and 10.30. We're going to uh, relaunch our Sunday school after an extended hiatus of that. Uh, next Sunday as well, we're going to talk more about that in uh, just a minute. Right uh, after worship this morning, the worship ministry is going to meet uh, just down the hall here in room 115 for some planning for the fall. Uh, prepare for takeoff here. This will sound like we're uh, on an airplane. I uh, want to draw your attention to the seat back in front of you. Uh, their <laughs> returns uh, to our pew racks, our, our um, hymnals, and our uh, fellowship pad. I invite you to please uh, let us know that you're here on the fellowship pad. Those will be collected after worship. Also, uh, new to our pew racks here is a, a new pew Bible. Ooh. Oh. This is in the New International uh, Version. Uh, the previous ones were in the Good News uh, Version. We use the uh, New International Version, NIV, uh, on the screen. That's what I preach from. So the page numbers for our readings are uh, in the bulletin here this morning, so I invite you to turn there uh, for that. Give them a try. Give these pew Bibles a try. Uh, So that's all back in the uh, racks there. Uh, We're looking for uh, greeters uh, as we move back to two worship times uh, next Sunday, looking for, I see a few friendly folks here. Uh, So if you're friendly and want to greet folks uh, as they come into worship, we're looking for greeters. Please let the church office know if you're interested in greeting uh, at either 8 or 10.30 worship starting next Sunday. But you can't talk to them tomorrow. The church office will be closed uh, tomorrow in observance of the Labor Day holiday. But starting Tuesday, the office will be open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. every day, except Monday for the holiday, of course. told you about our worship time uh, change. We'll celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper uh, next Sunday in our worship. I mentioned uh, Sunday school here. I invite Sherry up to tell us uh, more about our upcoming Sunday school. I want to invite all of you, while Sherry's making her way up here, uh, I'll have a class in the adult lounge. It'll be a DVD-driven uh, study. Uh, we'll be looking at N.T. Wright and Michael Bird's uh, The New Testament You Never Knew. Uh, so that'll be an eight-week study of that. So I invite you to join us for that during the Sunday school hour. So I just wanted to draw your attention to the chart in your bulletin. Um, and please, if you have friends and family, uh, neighbors who uh, you think might want to join us for our Sunday school. Um, We're looking forward to that kickoff on September 12th. Um, And as well as we still could use another teacher for some rotating um, once or twice a month, um, as well as a helper for some of our classrooms. So if you're able to help us out there, we would greatly appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you, Sherry. This concludes our uh, morning announcement uh, today, Uh, so prepare for takeoff uh, as we uh, prepare our hearts for the worship of the living God.
As we gather in worship this morning, I invite you to join me for our call to worship that comes from Psalm 146. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Let us pray together. We give you thanks, O God of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for gathering us today in worship. We thank you that you alone are worthy of our worship and our praise. Lord, as we worship together uh, this morning, may we rest in your goodness and your love that has come to us in Jesus Christ, that has revealed to us our salvation in his death and resurrection. Speak that truth to us again as we worship together this morning. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Our opening hymn for us this morning is Jesus Shall Reign Where'er the Sun. Please stand. Let us affirm our faith together by saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us together confess our sin with our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray together. Holy Father, forgive us. Though you should guide us, we inform ourselves. Though you should rule us, we control ourselves. Though you should fulfill us, we console ourselves. For we think your truth too high, your will too hard, your power too remote, your love too free. But they are not. And without them, we are of all people most miserable. Heal our confused mind with your word. Heal our divided will with your law. Heal our troubled conscience with your love. Heal our anxious hearts with your presence. 
all for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who loves us and gave himself for us. We pray in his name. Amen. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sin in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you this day in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Amen. be seated. I invite the children forward for our children's time here this morning.
Thank you, Forrest and Casey. So we enter into our prayer time here for this morning. We want to uh, continue to, to pray for our world, especially those who are enduring uh, natural disasters around us. Uh, prayers for our work, uh, the work that uh, God's given to us individually, the work that God's called us to uh, together as citizens of his kingdom. Also, I uh, got word this morning, uh, we want to pray uh, for uh, Kim Drapala's family. Her grandnephew, Tanner, uh, was killed in a motorcycle accident yesterday, uh, so we want to pray for the Drapala family. Let's come before the Lord in prayer together. We give you thanks, O oh God, for your mercy that you extend to us each and every day, your mercy extended to us in Jesus Christ. We thank you that we have forgiveness, that we have hope in his resurrection, hope in life today and life everlasting. We thank you, O oh God, that you're a God of life and a God of forgiveness, a God who makes all things new. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that works in our lives and our hearts that speaks to us faith in Jesus Christ, your uh, spirit that encourages us to do the work of your kingdom. And we pray uh, this day that you would uh, continue uh, to guide us uh, in all of the work that you set before us. We uh, thank you on this uh, Labor Day weekend here in this country for the work that you give to us that allows us uh, to provide for our families, the work that you have provided for us. And we thank you for the work that you set before us, uh, the work of your kingdom, here as members of the Church of Jesus Christ in Level Green. So we pray for our world this day, O oh God. We uh, continue to pray uh, for our world in this season of pandemic, that you would be with those uh, battling the COVID-19 virus and those who are treating those who are ill. Uh, continue to give us patience and endurance through this, O oh God. Uh, we pray that uh, where there is uh, chaos in this world, that the peace of Jesus Christ would be made known. We lift up to you today those who are recovering from natural disaster, from flooding and wildfires in this country and around the world. Uh, Lord, that uh, your presence and your peace would be made known. We pray today for those in need of your healing. Pray today for those who are recovering from uh, illness and surgery. We pray for those who grieve this day as well. And we pray for uh, the Drapala family and uh, ask that your comfort and your peace be upon them, O oh God. For all who grieve in this time, uh, may you speak to us of the hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we pray together, O oh God, we ask that you would quiet our hearts as we come before you in a few moments of silent prayer. Hear our prayers, O oh God. We lift up to you the names and circumstances that are listed in our bulletin. Help us to be mindful and prayerful of those needs this week. We lift up to you our Sunday school schedule and uh, the work that you've set before us here, O oh God. We pray that you would stir in the hearts of our, our children, our families, all of us, uh, to grow closer to you, Lord Jesus, uh, through our Sunday school and through our discipleship efforts. Thank you for those who are volunteering their time and their gifts uh, to teach Sunday school and just pray, O oh God, your blessing upon our discipleship efforts here and all that we do for your kingdom and your glory. Thank you for this time together in worship and time together in prayer. And we ask all things in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
So we come now to a time in God's Word here this morning. I invite you to turn in your pew Bibles, uh, found on page 248, our Old Testament lesson from 1 Samuel chapter 21. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9 here this morning. 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 9. David went to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech the priest, the king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread to eat or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I have no ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us as usual whenever I set out. The men's bodies are holy even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord, he was Doeg the Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, Why don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. The priest replied, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed is in the valley of Elah, is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. From the New Testament this morning, we read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. This is found on page 837 here in your pew Bible. As Jesus proclaims that he is the Lord of the Sabbath here in Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. At that time, David went through the grain, or how about Jesus? Jesus went through the grain fields, we just talked about David, uh, on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and was completely restored, just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. We give thanks to God for his word to us today. Please join me in a word of prayer. We give you thanks, O God, for this time now in your word, your word of scripture that directs us to your word of life, your word made flesh in Jesus Christ. We pray, O God, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us of our salvation uh, that has come in Jesus Christ. Help us to find our Sabbath rest in the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. We ask all things in his name. Amen. Someday your children and grandchildren will talk about living in this time known as the Great Resignation. Record numbers of people are quitting their jobs over the last year or so. It seems as though everyone has a now hiring sign up outside of their business. 
people seem to be growing more and more dissatisfied with their work, and they seem to be looking for something more. I was trying to find some sort of good article uh, to, to cite here in this, but I, I, I don't understand. <laughs> I just don't understand it. But anyway, we live in this time of this great resignation, as it's called, and people are, are leaving their jobs and looking for something more. On this Labor Day weekend, uh, here we're reminded that as followers of Jesus Christ, we work for him, and we're thankful for the work that the Lord has given to us, and we're thankful for the ability to do it. Now, whatever our daily routine may be, we approach everything as an opportunity to glorify God and to serve others. We ultimately find our rest in Jesus Christ. So as we consider our work this morning, we hear Jesus calling us in the Gospel of Matthew here, chapter 12, verses 1 through 14, to rest in him. And as he does so, three points for us uh, to consider this morning as we consider uh, resting in the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the work that he also sets uh, before us. Uh, first, that is to hunger for Jesus uh, and to trust in God's mercy and trust that God provides healing in our lives. So first here, we are to, uh, uh, we're to hunger for Jesus. Before we start into chapter uh, 12 here, we have to look at how chapter 11 ends. Jesus says there in verses 28 through 30, and you can read along in your pew Bible if you'd like there, since I'm to show I'm not making this up. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So that's important for us to hear as we move into chapter 12, and we see another showdown here between Jesus and the Pharisees. So as Matthew 12 begins, we see Jesus and his disciples walking through a field of grain on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week on a Saturday. So the disciples get hungry and they begin to pick some grain and eat it. Uh, this made me think of when my, my granddad used to eat the apples off of our apple tree that fell on the ground, and I thought that was like the grossest thing uh, ever, right? And so just picturing this, these guys had to be hungry, right, if they're uh, picking grain from this field. So what they were doing uh, was allowed in the law, it permitted you to eat from someone's grain field, uh, even on the Sabbath, if you didn't take any more uh, than you needed. In Deuteronomy uh, 23, verse 25, it says, uh, if you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle to their standing grain. So you were allowed to cut through your neighbor's grain field. You were allowed to take some grain if you were hungry. Grain was left uh, in the field even after the harvest. Uh, for, so all year there would be some grain in the field uh, for people who were traveling or for the poor who needed something to eat. So this provision under the law here was sort of an ancient welfare system. Uh, if you will. This is the, uh, the agricultural food bank right here uh, that Jesus uh, and his disciples are enjoying. So the Pharisees catch the disciples uh, eating the grain that they've picked. And the Pharisees, of course, don't reprimand the disciples, the men who are eating this grain. Instead, they reprimand Jesus. They're always trying to catch Jesus breaking the law. They're not as concerned about his uh, disciples, uh, but so the, the Pharisees here are convicting Jesus of allowing his disciples uh, to harvest on the Sabbath, which is not really what they're doing at all. So ultimately, we find, uh, we know that Jesus uh, is rest. So the Pharisees are, are carefully watching Jesus uh, here and his disciples, waiting for them uh, to break the law. So they say that Jesus... Uh, is violating God's law by not resting on the Sabbath. The Pharisees and others who were responsible for creating and maintaining the law made the Sabbath a burden. For example, if you had a prosthetic limb under the law, you were not allowed to wear it on the Sabbath because it was considered a burden. Like if you had false teeth, you had to take them out on the Sabbath because it was considered a burden that you were carrying and you could not wear them on the Sabbath. So it was getting a little complicated this time. So enter Jesus 
into the midst of all these rules and regulations. Jesus presents himself as our Sabbath rest, that, we, that Jesus is rest. God rested on the seventh day of creation, and he calls his people to do the same as the Old Testament begins, as we re- read that creation account. When the law is uh, given in Exodus chapter 20, and again in, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, the fourth commandment, uh, as we know it, goes into great detail. If you look at the Ten Commandments uh, in full, the fourth one is about the longest of them. It goes into great detail as the Lord calls his people of Israel to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. So all of these things, the, the, rest, the Lord God resting on the seventh day uh, and the fourth commandment all point to Jesus, that Jesus is our Sabbath rest. The people of God will ultimately find their rest through faith in God the Son, Jesus Christ. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we know that faith is about living in relationship with the living God, not about maintaining the rules. So as Jesus presents himself as our Sabbath rest, we are to rest in Jesus. The point of Sabbath is for us uh, to rest, is for people. It shows that God loves us, that God cares about us. Sabbath reminds us who's in control of our lives. Sabbath is about taking time to connect with God. It allows us to enjoy God's goodness. And rest replenishes us uh, to continue uh, in our work. It sounds easy, but it's not. We have to schedule Sabbath time, time set aside uh, to renew our relationship uh, with the living God. I had an elder who uh, owned his own business, and he put it this way, let the world take a turn without you. I thought that was pretty good. So some of you may uh, consider uh, this day, the Lord's Day, Sunday, as a, a Sabbath day. Now, the Sabbath has always been and always will be the seventh day on, on Saturday, and if you consider this a day of rest, I say, God bless you. I come from that uh, tradition as well. My grandparents were very good uh, to do that. My parents maintained that by asking if we could do anything on Sunday. They would say, no, it's closed, even though it wasn't. My brother told me a few years ago that he was uh, asked to stop by a business on a Sunday, and they said, wait a minute, you're open on a Sunday? (laughs) We were always told things were closed. We weren't allowed to do things. So if uh, Sunday is that day where you uh, commune with God, you're It's different from the other six days uh, of your life. I say, God bless you for that, but it's not a day that we have to uh, maintain Sabbath. Jesus uh, is the fullness of our Sabbath rest. We're told of our everlasting Sabbath rest that comes through faith in Jesus Christ in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 through 11 there say, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works just as God did from his. Let us, therefore, make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. So this means as we now rest uh, in, in Jesus, that means that we don't have to do anything. Jesus has taken care of all of it. He does provide for us our salvation in his death and in his uh, resurrection. We will respond to God's mercy, God's uh, God's gift to us of of resting in him in worship, both what we do here and everything that God calls us to do is now worship, given over to the glory of God. God has designed us to worship him. If you're ever not here on a Sunday morning, not watching our our live stream, you feel like something's missing, right? Because God has created us uh, to worship him. We're a Sabbath people uh, to rest and to worship uh, our God who has come to us in Jesus Christ. So as we, uh, we live for Jesus now, as our lives have been transformed by the good news of Jesus Christ, we now rest ultimately in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We do this because we trust in God's mercy. Jesus responds uh, to the Pharisees here by giving two examples uh, from the law. He's telling these rule givers uh, to read where their, their rules are coming from here. Uh, the first example that he gives is from David. We're going to talk about uh, David in, in just a minute here. The second is uh, from the priests in the temple who are working on the Sabbath. The temple would be in operation 
every day as people seek forgiveness of their sins, as they come to the temple uh, with their offering to be forgiven of their sin. So with this, Jesus uh, proclaims that he is greater than the temple, that the sacrifices in the temple have been done to direct the people of Israel to the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross, that he alone is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. No other sacrifices need to be made for us to be given, we just, to be forgiven. We just trust uh, that the Lord Jesus provides us uh, with our forgiveness that we need. Jesus uh, then quotes from the prophet Hosea, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, that says there, I desire mercy and not sacrifice the acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings, that God is always about mercy and not about our sacrifice, that he ultimately provides that sacrifice to forgive us of our sin in the cross of Jesus Christ. So in doing all this, Jesus proclaims the innocence of his disciples. They were not intentionally trying to violate the Sabbath. Jesus then proclaims that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He refers to himself here as the Son of Man, as he frequently does uh, during his ministry. That was the one title he used uh, for himself. And uh, saying here that that he alone uh, provides us with rest. Uh, that he provides us with rest from the worries of this life, and he provides us with comfort for all of eternity as well. So as we trust in God's mercy, we see that God is merciful to us. Jesus uh, cites the actions of David uh, in our Old Testament lesson from 1 Samuel chapter 21. A little context here. David is uh, running for his life here at this point. He's running from Saul, who's the king of Israel, who is trying to kill him at this point. So uh, David's seen as a threat to Saul because uh, Saul knows that David now has the Lord's favor and he will be the next king of Israel. So David and his men who are not with him at this time are are hungry and they come to the temple at Nob uh, for something to eat. Now the only thing that's there is the bread of the presence. That would have been in the holy place in the tabernacle. Now, if we read this carefully, it tells us that the bread is a week old. So these guys were plenty hungry because this is what they they took. This is the only thing available to them. This bread, uh, this bread of the presence, serves as a reminder that God provides our daily bread. Just as God provided manna in the wilderness for his people of Israel uh, as they're leaving their captivity in Egypt, that God provides daily bread. Of course, uh, Jesus says, I am the bread of life, that he alone is able to satisfy us. So as Jesus cites David here in in 1 Samuel 21, uh, he's saying that if you're going to condemn me, you're going to condemn David for what he did as well, which the Pharisees would never condemn David. Uh, David and his men uh, were not permitted to eat this bread. Ahimelech, the priest who has uh, given them this bread, is not permitted to do this, but no one is punished because God's mercy is greater than than the rules. Hungry men were fed by the bread of the presence. So we see God's mercy being extended to David and God's mercy being made fully known in Jesus Christ. So as we receive God's mercy in our lives, we are to be merciful to others. As we grow into a deeper understanding of God's mercy in our lives, we will show that mercy to other people. As we continue to grow closer to the Lord, we see God's mercy time and again in our lives. We see mercy uh, from other people, and we will desire also uh, to be merciful. It goes against our, um, our human condition, right? We always want uh, revenge. We want to take what's ours, but God uh, calls us to forgiveness and to be merciful to others as he ex- extended his mercy to us in Jesus Christ. Finally here, we see that God provides healing. Jesus goes into the local synagogue here where he finds a man with a shriveled hand. Now, this man may very well have been planted by the Pharisees that Jesus would see this man and and desire to, to heal him. So they're trying once again here to catch Jesus breaking the Sabbath law. Healing on the Sabbath was not permitted. Jesus asked the the Pharisees then, as he's scolded for uh, wanting to heal this man, 
uh, if they would rescue one of their animals that's in distress on the Sabbath. So doesn't God even care more about us as human beings made in his image? It's always lawful, according to the author of the Sabbath, the Lord Jesus himself, to do good on that seventh day. Jesus uh, shows this by healing the man's hand. The Pharisees respond in this. Uh, we would be in awe of this healing if we would see this uh, and see that Jesus is the Son of God, but the Pharisees instead uh, plot to kill Jesus. They do this because they realize that Jesus has come to put them out of business, that Jesus has come to fulfill the law, and so uh, their way of life is endangered by Jesus, and so they they want to do away with him. So we see that God provides uh, healing here as Jesus heals this man. We know that rest uh, provides us with healing as well. A contemporary Christian author and uh, pastor, Kevin DeYoung, uh, we went to the same seminary, he's just a few years older than me, uh, he wrote a book a few years ago entitled Crazy Busy, a mercifully short book about a really big problem. The book is short, has a lot of good insight on how to surrender our busy lives over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. DeYoung says about Jesus that he understood his mission. He was not driven by the needs of others. They often stopped to help hurting people, as we see Jesus healing this man in the temple. He was not driven by the approval of others, though he cared deeply for the lost and the broken. Ultimately, Jesus was driven by the Holy Spirit. He was driven by his God-given mission. He knew his priorities and did not let the many temptations of a busy life deter him from his task. He knew that, the, that he had come to earth uh, to be a atoning sacrifice for our sin and his death on the cross. And we rest in the healing that God provides us through the cross of Jesus Christ. We trust in our own lives that when we rest, uh, it provides uh, healing to us as well. It then allows us to further work for the glory of God. We know that our work provides healing as well. So how do we heal people with our work? It's easy for us if we might be in the, the medical profession uh, to see how our work may bring uh, healing to other people. Uh, that would be very clear, right? But simply putting others at ease would provide healing. If you're able to provide a, a automotive repair for someone whose car's broken down, uh, that would ease uh, their mind. Uh, if you're able to, to help serve people food, uh, that provides for a basic need uh, that they have. It uh, puts others at ease. Um, knowing that God continues to provide for us and God calls us to that work as we provide healing uh, to those around us as well. We trust that the work that God has called us to individually and together shows that God provides healing in this life and for all of eternity. Faith in Jesus Christ transforms every aspect of our lives, even the way we view our everyday work. So we continue to hunger for Jesus. We see Jesus and his disciples, uh, his disciples growing hungry and eating this uh, grain, uh, trusting that, that God alone can ultimately satisfy us, that Jesus is our rest. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. So we continue to rest in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, trusting that he is in control of our lives and of this world. We continue to trust in God's mercy as God has been Merciful to us, we continue to desire to be merciful to others as well, reflecting God's mercy that we have experienced time and again. We know that God provides healing in this life and in life everlasting, that we rest knowing that God heals us, and we work knowing that God heals us as well, that we are instruments of God's healing power here in this world. We thank our God that he has gifted us in the Holy Spirit, faith in Jesus Christ gifted us to do the work of his kingdom. May we continue to work together as the church of Jesus Christ here in this place to proclaim the good news of salvation, God's mercy that has been extended to us once and for all time in the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. We thank you, O God, for extending your mercy to us in the Lord Jesus. 
that we deserve uh, punishment and death for our sin. You uh, provide us with life and forgiveness. This is good news, and we pray that uh, your spirit would encourage us to tell others this good news as well. We thank you again for the work that you have set before us uh, in our everyday lives and our work together as the church. Lord, give us wisdom and vision and courage as we proclaim this good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We pray all things in his holy and precious name. Amen. Our closing hymn for us this morning is Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. Please stand. now receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.